Everyone sitting here right now has made a decision that is going to change your life forever. <laughs> Every single one of you, you've decided to come to my talk and not the other one. Your life is never, ever going to be the same again after this talk. I'm going to let you in on a really little secret that only a select few people on earth actually know. And once you've left this talk, if you do exactly as I say, in a couple of years, you're going to build the next Facebook. You, you're going to build the next Snapchat. And you, you're going to build the next Twitter. <laughs> Every time you release something, it is going to be the biggest success you've ever had. Your users are going to love you for it, and they're going to love your app. They're going to be begging you to take their money. They're going to be lining up on the street for days and days in the weather just to be the first person to get your product. Does that sound great to you guys? Yeah. Do you want to be rich? Do you want to be successful? <laughs> Do you want to have the biggest house in the richest neighborhood and drive the richest car? I <laughs> I'm telling you, none of you are going to have to work another day for the rest of your entire life. I'm getting really excited just describing this to you guys. <laughs> okay, so here it is. This is this big secret that I'm going to tell you about. I'm ready to tell you. This is the secret. All right. OK, so the secret. The secret is, actually, hold on, hold on. That is really, really stupid. There is no secret. Did you guys seriously think that I was going to get up here and tell you the secret to make you rich and successful? Yeah. Why the hell would I get up here and tell you guys the secret to success? My friends put the money in your account. <laughs> <laughs> Do you guys know? I don't know. You guys don't know me. I'm really not perfect, and I don't know everything. If in some, by some miracle, I had the secret to success, how do you guys know? How do I know that if it works for me, it's going to work for you guys? Sorry, but the only secret I'm telling you guys about today is called the cold hard truth. It's called reality. It's going to hurt, and you might get a little bit upset, but the truth is, you've all been lied to. You've been told that there's a secret formula for success, and that if you follow this formula right down to the T, it will make you rich and successful. It's going to give you the best chance of success. But actually, this formula is not helping your chance for success. If anything, it is the reason for your lack of success. What the hell am I talking about? I'm going to step back, and I'm going to fill you guys in a bit. So I'm Phil, and I work as an iOS dev for a company down in Sydney called Billu. And we're really passionate about great software. That part you just heard of my talk is what I like to call the hook. And it's specifically designed to reel you guys in with some energy and get you excited. And now I'm going to break convention a little bit more. And instead of diving into this really long talk about something that you just have to kind of sit there and wonder what the hell is he saying, and then kind of get to the end of the talk and realize I actually didn't get any of that, I'm going to break those conventions and I'm going to tell you exactly what the point of my talk is up front. I'm going to be really direct. And in, in the interest of being a deliberate hypocrite and really specifically emphasizing this point, I'm going to summarize the entire point of my talk in about 30 seconds. And you'll see, you'll, you'll realize exactly what the purpose of my talk is. So rushing is really bad. Take your time and build better things. That's it. That's all I've got to say. Don't rush. Now let's unpack this idea a bit more. We are living in this world that is full to the brim of people who have an unbridled obsession 
with extreme speed. We're all stuck in fast forward. Every single thing that you can get, you can get it really fast. If you're into reading, you can speed read. If you're into walking, you can speed walk. If you're like me and you're single and you're really into dating, you can speed date too. If you call lots of people, you've got speed dial. So I'm talking about every single thing that you can imagine, but imagine it on an industrial scale. Instead of just fast food, all we do is we eat, instead of just food, all we do is eat fast food. We make podcast apps that are designed to trim the silence from our favorite shows, just like fat. And we work out, we did fast workouts so we can get fit during our lunch breaks. Things that you would expect are slow activities. They are not safe from this obsession. I can see, I've seen fast yoga, like fast meditation, and changing your career and becoming a lead senior developer in just 21 days or less. Fast is just ingrained in the fabric of our entire society. And we are all addicts. Society has actually gotten to the point where we reject people who are slow. We think of people, we frown upon these people as lazy, as unproductive, as really boring people and members of society. And in some ways, we actually consider people, we use the term mentally slow, like mentally stigmatized for being slow. And that, as you would have expected, has somehow weaved its way into the way that we build products and that we build software. There's so many different names for this now. People call it Agile, they call it Scrum, they call it Lean, and they call it Delivery. But I really tend to think it has become this kind of thing that is like a virus, and it evolves into different strands and different genes just to become immune to the anti antibiotics that we use to treat it. I read this. It was only tweeted by Mike about three days ago. It was perfect for this talk. And he says, if you're embarrassed by your 1.0, you've probably been reading too many lean startup books, and your app probably just sucks. Instead of focusing on our own unique things, our people, our teams, and our products that make us really great, we bootstrap our ideas and our work into someone else's thinking and we drive at a billion miles an hour in the fast lane, we barely get enough time to slow down, to stop, and to actually see where we are and what we are doing. And that's exactly the reason I really, really love coming to DevWorld, because I get to meet a rich community of like dynamic and amazingly awesome people, and indie devs from all over Australia, have different backgrounds and different experiences. That's why I love DevWorld so much. And so to build products that our users love and that are really impactful, that are valuable, and that are memorable products, it's something that takes time. In order for us to be building great apps that reach their potential and that have a really lasting effect, not just for our clients, but for the people that actually need these products, the users that actually need, that have the need, we need to slow down. We really need to be more intentional about our work and considerate. And we need to work with intent to be meticulous about details. A really good friend of mine, his name's Tom, and he has a way better job than me. He drives an ambulance. He, walk, he literally drives around every day and he saves lives, which is a lot more exciting than what I do for a living behind a keyboard. <laughs> so one day I'm talking to Tom and he just randomly out of nowhere says to me, Phil, the other day I performed a social experiment at work. And I'm like, dude, what? Like a social, what are you talking about? And he, so he says, I wanted to see what would happen if I was driving the ambulance and I just literally slowed down on a busy highway. What happened? So Tom looks at me and he says, 
I got an emergency call to a woman in Bondi who was having a heart attack. <coughs> Just like every other day, I jumped in the ambulance and I sped out onto a road full of traffic. The road was packed, like it was peak hour, there were cars everywhere. So I just gave it a shot. What the hell? I blared the siren as loud as it could physically go, and I slowed the ambulance down. Would you believe that when I slowed the ambulance down, cars moved right out of the way? A small gap got larger and larger and larger, and I ended up getting right to my destination faster than any other day and helped the heart attack patient. What my friend noticed in his ambulance is a far more common occurrence than anyone leads us to believe. It's an idea that lends itself to this thing called the slow revolution. Conventional wisdom tells us that if we slow down, we are roadkill. That's it for us. But in actual fact, the exact opposite thing, just like for Tom, turns out to be true. If you slow down judiciously at the right times, you will find that people work better, they play better, they learn better, they eat better, and they live better. Sweden is constantly dabbling with this concept of shorter work weeks. And just this year, they implemented again this movement of, uh, in the home care service industry, workers moving towards a six hour workday. And they found that if nurses are at work on more frequent and shorter shifts, then they are mentally more healthy. And the collective health of the entire hospital, all of the residents, all of the patients, is increased. And that means that patients get higher quality care. Nurses, since moving to six hour workdays, are 20% more happier. And the change allows them to participate in 64% more activities with their patients. So when I say slow, I don't mean doing every single thing at a snail's pace. When I say slow, I'm talking about doing everything at just the right speed. Musicians like to call this the tempo giusto, or the correct rhythm. If you can get as close to that pace as possible, you're going to do whatever it is that you're doing, but you're going to do it far more effectively and most importantly to me, is you're going to enjoy it a lot more. For me, slow is this, this shift from prioritizing quantity to prioritizing quality. It's about, instead of living still lives with really rigid frameworks for things, prioritizing dynamic experiences and having a sense of um, empowerment in what you do. Slow might not necessarily be the right word, Instead of slow, I could get up here and I could say work with passion. But the word slow has become synonymous with this whole idea of the slow revolution because it's a bit countercultural and it's, a bit, it's universal. And the thing I love the most about the word slow is slow stops people in their tracks. Slow is like, you can think of it as a linguistic lever. It's a way of getting this conversation going, even though it might not go deep enough into the problem, it really knows how to rile the right people up. So every single solution needs a problem. Why is speed such a problem? So speed is a false equivalency. It's exactly like being on a hamster wheel. When you're working on a project team and you're accruing mountains and mountains and mountains of tech debt, that never actually gets paid off. What we see is that we're blazing through tasks on Trello, on Jira, on the to-do list really, really fast. And we think that we're productive, but what we're actually doing is we're making every single task collectively harder and harder and harder than it needs to be. We really quickly get into this situation where we estimate the complexity of tasks as something that should be really simple and straightforward, but in reality, it's taking a lot longer than it needs to take. So think about having to implement dynamically sized table view cells. 
With iOS 8, we got this really neat API that makes it as simple as one line of code, and then you can just throw it over the fence and let auto layout take care of the rest. But actually, on that day at work, we were in a bit of a rush, and we decided that we didn't really need to implement auto layout constraints properly. So our cells don't actually have enough constraints and information to size themselves correctly. And actually, if we're going to get this to work, we're going to have to perform open heart surgery on our cells. And yeah, that's actually going to take a few days. I like to think about this whole idea in this way. I don't know how, but at some point when I was a kid, I figured out this trick that I use to approach every single decision that I make. And that is, if I'm given two options for something, I could decide to take a gain in the short term, whatever that gain might be, but I'm going to be subject to a greater loss in the long term. Or otherwise, I could choose to take a bit of a loss in the short term, and then I get subjected to a greater gain in the long term. And for me, when I was in high school, that probably just meant something stupid like uh, skipping lunch and then getting to the handball courts first before everyone else, which was awesome. But as devs and as creative people, it's actually more about choosing to take a hit in the short term. And that might be a few project delays. It might mean a bit of slowness. It might mean having to stop and actually talk through a problem and nut out the details. But it means that in the long term, we're producing something that we are really ridiculously proud of. And we get to delight our users. And we get to build something that is potentially a lasting success. Speed, really, is an excuse that developers use because they're too scared to hustle and be better at what they do. Confusing and unreadable code becomes really, really hard to change. And hard to change means it takes more time, things are far more complex, it costs a lot more money, and it means that we have less time to build the exciting features that our users really love. And the problem is machines don't care. Machines are machines. Compilers, they're going to compile bad code in the exact same time that they're going to compile well-considered code. <laughs> Will Cunningham once said that a mess is not technical debt. A mess is just a mess. Technical debt decisions are made based on the project's constraints. They are risky, but they can be beneficial. The decision to make a mess is never rational. It's always based on laziness and unprofessionalism and has no chance of being paid back in the future. A mess is always a loss. Dave Thomas, one of the guys that was in the room when they wrote the manifesto for agile software development, gave a really awesome talk at Yale Connected last year. And he gave a really great insight into some of the ways that the manifesto's core ideas have kind of been a bit misconstrued over time. But I think that those core ideas really lend themselves to hitting the nail right on the head with this. He said that what we can't express through words, we can't comprehend. And if we keep an open mind, if we learn new languages, and we look at different ways to solve problems, we can achieve a deeper understanding in the work that we do. <laughs> so slowing down is about slowing down at the right times. And it's also about speeding up at the right times too. For instance, responding really quickly to change is a perfect trait for a great team. And delivering working software constantly on a short time scale is also a really, really awesome idea. Taking a dynamic approach to things and a really fluid approach to your dev leads to a far better outcome than not. But there's still this common misconception among the community that technical excellence, product quality, 
and delightful user experiences are things that must be sacrificed in the name of speed. And it is simply not true. When you're approaching quality in your product, what you want is not actually speed. What you want is productivity. You want to get as much done as you can. You want to build the coolest and the best app out there, don't you? And to do that, you can actually have these both. You can have it both ways. To do that, you actually need to slow down when it comes to language. Language is this thing that is limiting to the world around us. If you use language poorly, it has the ability to limit your potential. But if you use it well, it can actually open up a lot of possibilities for you as a developer. And language is just a great resource in general for productivity and for long-term efficiency as on a dev team. This is a bit nerdy, but there's a, there's a thing I learned at, uh, back at uni. I studied journalism. I studied language communication. There's this thing called discourse. And really simply, it's just a vocabulary that is specific to a group of people that all share a specific field of interest. The definition, the totality of codified language used in a given field of intellectual inquiry and social practice, such as legal discourse, medical discourse, or uh, iOS development discourse. Discourse is everywhere, and it defines all of our social boundaries. It creates meaning and it affects the perspectives that we have on every single thing that we experience, whether we know it or not. So taking the time really early on in a project to construct this framework for a well-defined discourse is going to mean that everyone on your team, whether they're developers, designers, project managers, clients, are going to communicate really well and really clearly when it comes to reasoning about business logic, when it comes to thinking through architectural designs and decisions, and when you're trying to create pragmatic approaches to the problems that you have. There's another thing, also nerdy, is domain-specific language. And it's a form of discourse. It's essentially a dictionary that a group of people have, but it's actually usually unspoken dictionaries. It's just things that we inherently agree upon. Like iOS devs, this might be all the terminology related to a framework. Uh, yeah, like Swift kind of is part of the, the iOS domain-specific language. So your team can actually get together at some point in your project, and you can define a list of domain-specific terms that are related to your app. You might ask, like, what are the key areas of my app? What's the logical flow of information through my app? How does this information change when a user is using the app? And what are these things that we create that are responsible for this flow of information? And I'm telling you they're not all called managers. Slowing down, spending the time to use a whiteboard is actually a really awesome example of slowing down in order to speed up. As speed addicts, we tend to jump right into code, trying to solve the problem straight away without actually stopping and thinking through the problem before we even have a chance to discuss the problem. Next time you're working on something, no matter how small it might be, no matter how big it might be, look around, find a whiteboard, and find a random teammate, and talk through the, the problem that you're trying to solve. I'm telling, that you, I'm telling you that the chances are you're both going to come up with a better, more efficient solution than you otherwise would have, and you'll solve the problem in a lot shorter time. There's this thing called pull requests. They're my favorite thing, because they're really effective mechanisms to make teams efficient. And you would, you would think that pull requests are another process, another barrier, another thing to slow you down. But taking the time to slow down and think about your approach to your code can actually speed you up. Explain the problem that you're trying to solve and how you're actually solving it. Whether your solution is the most viable solution and why you might think that is. And show your team members that you've actually tested it and that you're certain that it actually works as expected. 
because this is going to mean that your code review is faster for you and your teammate, and you're going to find the bugs that you might find a couple of days down the track faster, and your good code is going to get merged in a lot faster because you slowed down and you worked with intent. Language is a framework for every single thing that we do as engineers. It's no longer a peripheral in the world that we're in. It's actually central to our world. Sometimes we think of words as just the labels that we stick on things, the things that we name classes, doesn't matter what they do. But without language, we would really struggle to comprehend anything that we experience around us. So if we're slowing down and we're using language properly, we can still be meticulous with details, and we can still ship great apps on time. All day, every single day, we are communicating with computers and we're communicating with our team members. Communicating effectively and using all the different facets of language and being more fluid and open and transparent is going to make us more productive. Developers are really easily tricked by these traps of moving fast and breaking things. But the most effective devs in our craft at what we do are the devs that can see beyond that and they know when to slow down in order to speed up. So last week, I moved into a new apartment and I had to buy all new furniture. So of course, as you would expect, as a nerd and a bit of a hipster, I went to Ikea and I bought a really nice bed frame and a mattress and all these other Ikea, like everything in my apartment is just Ikea. But I actually, the problem was I got home and I had to figure out how to assemble it. So my dad and I, at one point, we're sitting in the living room and we're trying to assemble this bed. And it literally, we were sitting there for hours trying to get hundreds of screws and joints and pieces of wood to fit together. And at one point, I remember vividly that it was like 11.30 p.m. My dad was getting ticked off and it did not look like there was any, we were anywhere close to the end. So we decided to rush through the IKEA instruction manual and skip a few pages. If you've ever assembled IKEA furniture before, then you know, do not skip instructions. <laughs> it's like the equivalent, uh, IKEA equivalent of shooting yourself in the foot. And my bed quickly became a mess. We found spare screws that were not meant to be spare screws, and uh, there were spare parts all over the floor. This thing looked nothing like or even close to being a bed, and there was still 40 pages left in the manual. We, it looked like we were never going to get this bed finished. So we decided 12.30, let's just call it quits, let's stop, let's get a good night's sleep and come back the next day. Because we actually slowed down and we readjusted ourselves and we found the right speed for us, we came back the next day and we assembled my bed in like under an hour. So I don't have this get rich quick scheme that I told you. I don't have a magic formula that you can use to build the next unicorn Facebook startup. But what I can tell you is to actually love what you do and do what you do with passion. The App Store these days has been around for a long time. It's full of to-do lists, it's full of note apps, and it's full of sound recorders. All of these people around us are running around literally like headless chickens trying to ship these crappy things called MVPs. And they're junk. If you go and you do the exact same thing, your work is not going to stand out. I can tell you that. So be different. Go against the grain and break the conventions a little bit. Actually use some time to build something that you yourself are super proud of. If you love your work, you can live through your work instead of just rushing right over the top of it. So that's me. and. Thanks, everyone. Enjoy the conference.